Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Julian Schwarzenbach. I'm chair of the BCS Data Management Specialist Group. So I'd like to welcome you to tonight's webinar, um, where we're going to be looking at uh, data protection subjects that's getting more interesting as time goes on, as particularly as software and employee monitoring starts to get more intrusive. Um, we're titled, Whose Legitimate Interest Is It Anyway? Um, tonight, we would, were due to be having both Rowena Fielding and Gary Shipsy doing a, a double act. Unfortunately, Rowena is unwell, so he's not able to join us tonight. So, in fact, Gary will be uh, running both sides of the discussion, so to speak. Um, Gary's got a lot of experience in um, information governance, data privacy. And as, as he quotes, uh, he started privacy when phones weren't smart and Google was just another fledgling search engine. Obviously, time has moved on and Gary has... Um, been involved in helping a lot of other organizations thinking through about their data protection issues. But before I hand over to Gary and let him share his slides and take us through the, the case study, a uh, quick bit of housekeeping. So first off, uh, this is a Zoom webinar rather than Zoom meeting. So if you have questions for Gary, um, please post them in the Q&A box and we will, I will ask them on your behalf when we get to that appropriate point. Um, just going to move on to the next slide. But um, and two quick plugs. So first is um, our annual virtual conference that we run with Dharma UK will be between the 20th and 24th of June. So we're actually running two webinars a day throughout that week. And since it's 10 years since the Open Data Institute was founded, we're running, we're using open data as the theme. So the speakers we've got, we've actually got a really good range of speakers. We're starting off with Professor Sir Nigel Shadbolt, who is, um, I think, Chief Exec of the ODI. So he's going to give us that keynote to open things off. Claire Griffiths from the UK Health Security Agency talk about the COVID health dashboard. Uh, TFL, uh, you probably may be familiar with some of their apps and the way they enable developers to get their data available. So Chloe Davis will talk about that. We've then got Richard Dobson from the Energy Systems Catapult. John Murray, who we've had speak before about eight years ago on Open Data. He's coming back and looking at how the world has changed since then. Andy Mabbott from the organization or Pigs on the Wing. We're talking about OpenStreetMap as mature open linked data. We then got Anita Payne from Offwatt talking about their open data strategy. So that from a regulator perspective will be really interested. interesting. And then we have Alex Luck, who has got a strong information security background, and she's going to maybe be presenting a slightly more cautionary side of things around open data and maybe some of the things you might want to think carefully about before you make them open. Uh, and then the final sort of uh, webinar of the week is going to be a conversation session on the Friday morning with Gavin Starks, who formerly led the ODI. He's been involved in banking, open energy, and a variety of other things. So just going to have more of a, a conversational session with Gavin to sort of explore sort of how he got where he is and his thoughts for the future. And then we're going to end the week with a panel debate. I'm surely going to post the link to that in the chat. So uh, feel free to um, click on the link and invite yourself uh, and, uh, and register to attend any one of or all of those sessions. Uh, it is free, as all our webinars are. And also you don't have to attend all of them. So because there's two a day, it just makes it spread out throughout the week, just makes it a bit easier if people want to attend a couple or all of them. And then finally, if you're interested in joining the BCS and you're not currently a member, then there's currently a discount scheme running where there's a 20% discount running through until the 31st of August, 2022. And the code to use is the one on the screen at the moment. So. Uh, without further ado, what I'll do is I'll stop sharing and hand over to Gary, who will now take us through the um, take us through the uh, case study he's got for us around employee monitoring. Gary, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Julian. So uh, let me just check about sharing. Okay, hopefully that's fine. You are sharing screen. So yes, so welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm Gary Shipsey. So I'm the uh, data protection uh, director at Protect Your Technology. So uh, as Julian said, I've been doing data protection and FOI and all things uh, data and information related for a good number of years now. Uh, and I was, as I said, going to do this with my ex-colleague, uh, Rowena. So this has been hastily put together just, just to uh, have some slide content to talk through uh, legitimate interests and what it means in the context of work-placed surveillance. 
Uh, I'm just checking that everyone can see uh, the slides there and all the slide there. Okay. So I'm going to do a little bit where I just set the scene around what is legitimate interest, mainly because even though we're four years in to the day that GDPR became live in the UK, I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding around legitimate interest. We'll get said to, to us as data protection experts, oh, we have a legitimate interest to do this, so we're okay, surely. So we're just going to go ahead and do it. There is, you know, the business has a legitimate interest in adopting the latest uh, workplace surveillance technology with everyone working remotely. Surely that's okay then, we have a legitimate interest. So the first thing to say here is that that's not what we're looking at when it comes to data protection. The law doesn't say, well, if you have a general interest, that's enough. What we're actually asking and the question we need to be satisfied of the answer of is, well, do we want to rely on the legitimate interest condition to do certain processing of certain data for a certain reason? Now that's very different. So that means we've got to be a lot more specific right from the start. Well, what are we actually seeking to achieve? Why are we saying we want to rely on legitimate interests as our lawful basis, our justification for doing things. We've got to have a justification for processing data, for collecting it, analyzing it, sharing it, doing anything with it. We have to have a justification. And the law and the regulator, the ICO, are clear you should pick the justification that most accurately and fairly reflects the relationship you have with the individual whose data you are processing. And you may very well be aware, and I don't want to you know, teach people to suck eggs, but just to give you the clarity, there are six justifications for doing things with data. So right from the start, you've got to think, well, which is the most appropriate one for the activity we're looking to undertake? So does the deployment of surveillance software and tools at work meet a legal obligation? It probably doesn't. There's no compulsion in law to say you have to deploy certain software, otherwise none of us would have been working prior to COVID. Are you performing a public function? Is there a contract with the individual? Well, con contract of employment potentially is an area you might say, well, yes, there's a contract of employment that says we've got to do certain things with the employee. And that's quite right in that you will need to collect and use their data to pay them for health and safety reasons maybe for other contractual obligations that you have to the employee where you've got to use their data, pensions, tax, national insurance, disciplinary matters, etc. Again, I think it's questionable, and I think we'll put it aside for this uh, session, that it's a contractual requirement to be surveilled at work. Because again, it wasn't done prior to COVID and the rollout of all these pieces of software. If you want to go back and try and renegotiate all your contracts of employment, to insist that it's a condition of work, that's a whole other discussion and a whole other set of legal headaches you may be getting into from an employment law point of view. But it is a condition you could look at. Life or death situations, legitimate interests and consent. So these are the six justifications. Consent is not an option here because you know, we're not letting employees pick and choose when they're surveilled because that would be self-defeating, wouldn't it? <laughs> Uh, you know, you can't have a percentage of the workforce agreeing and a percentage of the workforce not agreeing. You know, you've either got to be consistent or not. It takes us then to legitimate interests. Now, legitimate interests, again, is a weighing up exercise. That's the whole point of what we're going to look at for the rest of this session. So it's not just saying, well, we have a legitimate interest, that's okay. True, we do have to establish, well, what are we trying to achieve? What purpose legitimate purpose are we seeking to achieve in processing this data but the critical bit that's sometimes overlooked is the other side of the equation because the law says well look you cannot rely on this condition if those if your interests are actually overridden by the interests rights and freedoms of in this case the employees so it's a balancing exercise that you have to undertake um, so you need to do you know, a legitimate interest assessment, something that says, well, OK, let's get it on record. Let's define and be very clear uh, what interests are we seeking to pursue? 
you know, what objectives are we seeking to achieve by processing this data? Why is it necessary? Because that was the first bit that's often overlooked. Why is it necessary to process the data this way? And we'll come on to that in a moment because it's an, that is a really interesting point. If we've managed staff well prior to deploying all these software and tools, why is it suddenly so critical and necessary to the business? Can we actually articulate that or not? And if we define the purpose and we have explained why it's necessary, then we've got to show, well, we have thought about the individuals whose data we're going to process. We've weighed up and looked at the impact on them. And why do we believe on balance that their rights are not being overridden by what we're planning to do with their data? So that's what we mean by legitimate interest is that we're going to rely on this condition, one of these six, we're going to rely on this one to do this processing of data for these reasons. So as you can see, it's a, it's a broad concept, legitimate interest. You're looking at lots of different rights and interests, the organization's ones, and I'll come on to those in a moment, and the individual. What potential impacts could it have on the employees in this, in this scenario? You know, could it actually lead to, uh, you know, an a inability to process and control their data, for example? Could it lead to some disadvantage, unfair disadvantage? So we need to start thinking about these issues when we're looking at relying on legitimate interest to process employee data for whatever workforce surveillance tools we may be looking to deploy. Uh, and I'll say right at the start here that one of the key things is transparency. Because if you actually bring staff with you, whether it's the union, whether it's rep reps of anything, at any departments, a formal process where you engage, the fact that staff know what you're looking to achieve, know the means you're looking to deploy, can raise issues. Uh, and it's not a surprise how you deploy this tool or the tools. A, that's just good employee management, but it's actually a good way of just really backing up your reliance on legitimate interests. Because if the process is, is unexpected and staff lose control over what's going on with their data, they didn't know what was happening, they couldn't object, they couldn't question it, then you know, you're going to struggle to rely on legitimate interests to justify what you're doing with that data. Uh, but to just you know, keep the balance uh, in track, uh, equal side of things, it doesn't mean there should be no negative impact at all. You can have a negative impact to some degree. It's about how far are we going in impacting upon people's rights, freedoms and interests. It's not an automatic, right, we've done that. It's, it's gonna have some harm to some audience of our staff, we just can't do it. It's not about that, it's about how far do we go and can we show we've considered the impacts and we're happy that it's within the boundaries of what we believe is acceptable to us and our employees. Uh, and quite clearly, it's particularly in this case, when it's looking at workplace surveillance, uh, the, the guidance from the regulator makes clear that it's not about making sure that your interests and the individual's interests are always in complete harmony. They don't have to be in complete harmony. Obviously, the closer you can get, then, you know, uh, it's, it's more likely you're going to be able to argue the impact is nominal, but they don't have to be directly aligned, you know. So this is about being confident, as the regulator says, confident that your interests are defined and understood and that they are not overridden by any risks you've identified when processing the data. You keep a record of your legitimate interest assessment uh, and in doing this, you then have the, the evidence, you have the ability to back up why you deployed, you know, certain processing of data to achieve the stated objectives, that you thought about the privacy impact on the staff, that you either adapted the system, and we'll look at some of the particulars in a moment of workplace surveillance, but you may have adapted the system, you may have only deployed it for certain staff in certain roles, you may have made uh, uh, you know, adaptions for certain disabilities, if staff have got that and you recognise the impact that deploying a system could have on them. But you've shown you've gone through the process to back up relying on legitimate interest to process the data. 
So just sort of preamble with that, just to sort of be clear what we mean by legitimate interest and the legitimate interest condition for processing data. The, the other part we just have to be very clear on is, is the P word, purpose. You know, purpose is absolutely fundamental to getting all processing of data, personal data, right. What are we actually trying to achieve? What is the you know, activity where, so what's the underlying objective? What are we trying to seek to achieve by processing the data? Why are we doing it? You know, what are we trying to achieve? And not get confused or conflated with the individual activities we might undertake to achieve those purposes, how we're going about it. And I think this is where with workplace surveillance, we, it, there's a lot of blurring because we jump to the activity, how we're gonna go about things. We're gonna deploy this tool. We're gonna monitor, you know, uh, deploying different cameras. We're going to do screen recording. We're going to do keyboard and mouse movements, all these things that we're going to do. But actually, why are we trying to, what are we trying to achieve? what data is going to be generated and what are we going to do with it? You know, if we don't understand that, we're going to really struggle. And I think that's what a lot of people jump forward to. So for example, if you, for example, when I use another training, people often say, well, I, what, what's my job? Well, I, I send emails. I do a lot of emails. Well, they're not the reason why you go to work every day. You may feel like that, <laughs> but they're a means to an end. Why are you sending the email? Well, that can very much depend on what department you work in and what you're seeking to achieve. We might send an email to you know, promote and do marketing. It might just be a transactional thing where we send a receipt back to someone. It might just be sending or responding to a query from a customer. The point is that the same processing activity, sending an email, can be used for a variety of different purposes, as we can see here. And the same personal data, an email address, can be used for a variety of different purposes. And this is where we need to think when we think about legitimate interests and workforce surveillance. Well, what are we trying to achieve? You know, because it makes a huge difference on how we can back up our rationale for processing the data. So this is where I have taken when if Rowena and I were doing this together, we'd have a bit of back and forth around you know i think when we've done it before i was a sort of union representative for the staff coming in and saying well i've heard this i heard that you want to surveil all, all my members and all the staff it's big brother gone uh, live it's 1984 all over this is terrible how can you justify it what are you doing and actually the number of times as a data protection sort of specialist when you just ask that very first question, well, what are we actually trying to achieve here? You know, what's the actual underlying business objective of deploying the workplace surveillance? Because it's very easy to over collect data. It's very easy to deploy all the features because they're just there and we can just turn them on. But that doesn't necessarily solve a problem. And it means we're starting to process data data that's probably quite maybe hard to uh, justify processing so what are the purposes <laughs> and uh the uh, uh, the, uh this is the and again this content is i think available uh, free on uh available on Romana's uh patreon uh which i thoroughly recommend uh subscribing to the and you get her wonderful thoughts and views on how you can look at this but that's the critical point what are the purposes if i'm a union rep looking at this i think well is it just trying to catch people out is it trying to catch staff who aren't constantly at their screen and, and you know constantly typing is it to deter people who step away and have lots of coffees or prove that someone is at their screen well if that's how we treat our staff and believe they operate are we just really trying to replace good hr management of staff you know how do we define what a productive employee looks like because it can have uh, you know perverse outcomes can't it if you tell me well i'm going to be marked on how attentive i am at the screen i may very well sit where the camera can see my face so it logs that i'm 
attentive, but it doesn't mean I'm focused on the right screen, caring what I'm doing, paying attention and engaging. Well, they're different characteristics. They are still things that good HR management should deliver and, and seek to achieve before any of this technical surveillance came along. You know, what actual activities are we looking to deploy to achieve one objective? Because if we don't know that, I mean, and the ones that came up, you know, that you can get in various different tools and software, there's a whole list of them, some more intrusive than others. You know, what is the business benefit? Again, what is the problem we're seeking to achieve? And some of them, you know, you can see maybe are oh, there's clear business benefits. Certain uh, industries have greater risks, which make a big difference to the rationale for wanting to, de to deploy things. I know certainly I've worked back in the day when I was a student in call centers where you logged every, you know, every minute you were there under a certain code to define what you were doing, whether you were doing the call, whether you were doing the wrap up notes, whether you went to the toilet, whether you were at lunch uh, and you had to codify everything so they could try and see you know what uh who was who was spending what time doing what but then you just gamified the system <laughs> that was the problem and did it actually achieve what you needed it to achieve did it give you any indication of how good i was at selling how committed i was to the role you know that's the question you need to be able to answer so you can imagine each of these uh features are different processing activities and you may need to do a legitimate interest assessment for each one because they may be more or less intrusive and have more or less impact on the uh, employee uh, because some of them are clearly far more intrusive there's clearly far more data being processed far more risk if that data was well either used internally or misused or lost or you know it was compromised in some way so actually understanding what the privacy impact uh, could be both if the system works as intended and it's used as you intend to use the data, but also thinking around the impact if things went wrong, if the data was compromised, what could happen to it? You know, what could happen to the member of staff? What impact could it have on their personal rights and freedoms? So before we even look at legitimate interests, we need to understand the answers to these questions. What problems are we trying to solve? What purposes are we trying to process the data for? And then what activities are we looking to undertake to achieve those purposes to solve those problems? And if we can get that clear, then we can say, well, okay, what is the justification for processing the data? And we said, it's not gonna be many of these conditions. We, <laughs> we could get into a, 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 a fight and change all the contracts of employment. But if we decide not to go down that route and look at legitimate interests, we then need to think, well, okay, let's look at what we're trying to achieve. We know it's necessary. What are the competing interests, the employees' interests and the organization's interests? You know, the use of data, this is not, you know, this is not to say that we shouldn't deploy workplace surveillance. This is saying, let's understand why we're doing it and what we're seeking to achieve. I know we're not just trying to replace proper line management, proper systems that have existed before with data for the sake of it. We need to actually show that we are meeting our organizational objectives by deploying the software to the extent that we are. You know, are we meeting the employee's interests of having uh, a, you know, a humane treatment, a respectable work environment, supportive management, a non-toxic, non-hostile work environment, a place where their rights are upheld and, not, and rights are not denied. Whilst we are trying as an organization to show that we are doing the right things by our stakeholders, whoever they may be. And this is where you show in your legitimate interest assessment for a particular processing of activity to achieve the particular objective that we are weighing up the different interests. And, and it really does depend. I mean, as Rowena's uh, you know, content went through and when we did it as a back and forth, we sort of went through the different, uh, uh, different, different scenarios with some of the different, uh, different tools. 
And you need to bear in mind, you know, if we establish what we're trying to uh, achieve, how we're going to go about it, you know, how different that is to what it was before, because when you worked in the office, you didn't have someone watching over your shoulder the whole time to make sure you were working. Why is it so different now? What's that data really going to tell you? And how is it going to be deployed? You know, there's so many things to consider when we're looking at processing all this data on the basis of a weighing up of interests, the organizations and the employees. You know, who's it going to be deployed upon? How do you quantify the value and the input that different levels of staff had? have? If someone's in a creative role, does being at their screen dictate that they're being creative? How do you, and if it doesn't, and you collect data on them, it shows they're not attentive. Does that mean that they're not doing their job or are you going to use that data against them or call them up for it? You know, what are you trying to achieve with that data? And are you going to start treating different roles differently? Because if it's achieving the clear objective, well, then surely you would deploy it at home, in the office, anywhere else. If it's achieving the objective you need to achieve or not, what's the argument against that? You know, how can you show that you only need to deploy it for certain roles you maybe are home workers and not office workers? So you can see that there's lots of uh, lots of steps to go through before we just say, oh, we're going to rely on legitimate interest to process this data. And if you know, you can imagine being a you know a representative of the staff, you would quite rightly push back and say, well, hang on, there's staff where this could have a detrimental impact. You aren't gonna be attentive the whole time. That their value to the organization is not necessarily easy to, easily defined by data and metrics from uh, you know, mouse tracking or uh, scanning their facial analytics to check they're attentive. You know, what are we trying to achieve? If we're trying to demonstrate certain things, if, if we're in a highly regulated environment, like in financial services, then you might be able to say, well, actually, there's some statutory obligations we're seeking to fulfill. We have to be able to demonstrate an evidence and certain oversight. We've got certain roles. You've got high levels of access. You've got high levels of authorization. We have to show that they are doing things in the right way. You know, but we've got to be able to evidence what we're trying to achieve and then show that we need to process the data to achieve it. Um, I feel like I've just uh, sort of gone through uh, and just hopefully outline the main main issues. I really wanted to have sort of questions and answers uh, uh, as, as much as anything, because I imagine this will throw up hopefully some questions and answers that will bring some of the personal issues to, to light. Um, yeah, so if I stop sharing my screen there, I'm happy to take, take uh, questions and answers, you know, give us some answers, hopefully. Yeah, right. Thank you, Gary. That's been re really interesting. A good, good introduction to the topic. And um, thank you for stepping in at short notice to play Rowena's part as well as your own part. Appreciate it. It's a bit of a, 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 an interesting di thank dilemma you. there. Yeah. Um, so, yes, just quick prompt to all. If you've got questions for Gary, things that you want to discuss, if you can type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, that means they can be upvoted, whatever. We can um, manage them a little bit easier. I know there's a few comments that are appearing in the chat, but I'm going I'm to refer to those in a second. Um, but one of the things that would be just interesting to just get a view from Gary is about the about the effectiveness of Boswags. You think that employees are endlessly inventive individuals, and when in a formal, a physical workplace environment, people would find all sorts of creative ways to not work when people were expecting them to be working. And I'm, I've got no doubt that whatever the software, whatever the tools are designed to do, people will fairly quickly work out ways to try and circumvent it, work it around it to skew the results. Mm. So, I mean, are there, is there any statistics or any information that shows that such monitoring w software actually works? I know that people selling it will tell you that, but something a bit more independent that gives a view of whether it works or not. Well, well that's a very good question, isn't it? I mean, and this is where... I think the the role of the sort of DPO is to, to ask that very question because actually, if the organisation or HR whoever's selling the software can't actually articulate the benefit, it then gets more and more difficult to be able to weigh up the legitimate interest in processing all this data. Um, 
but it's for that department and that function to to start to provide that evidence the, the dpo is is not there to try and back up and argue why the processing should happen they're there to say look here's the playing field here's the weighing up of different things you've got to consider Craigie, if, if if hr colleagues or the business can't put something in the in one side of the argument you're on a hiding to nothing already <laughs> yeah you know, you can, but I, I was just wondering sort of outside of the pure data protection thing of whether from a business benefit perspective are you aware of any, if there are any studies that are actually saying oh this monitoring has improved productivity and profitability by x percent reduced absenteeism I'm, I'm by not y or anything no, I, I, i'm not myself i mean uh, shane rowena may have a finger on more of the pulse of other things outside of that sadly but i'm not i'm not aware no but it's it is fascinating because it's it's as a DPO, that's the very first question to ask. It's like, okay, what are we, how's this going to achieve this? What's it going to do? Yeah. I mean, we've probably all got examples where we think back maybe in our past and think, well, yeah, I made sure those figures worked for me. <laughs> mm. You know, back, I think my mom was back in that call center job where actually your stats on sales were depending on the number of calls. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to start screening the calls then. I'm not going to waste my time dealing with giving out quotes for people who aren't going to buy insurance because it's six months away. Because <laughs> my, my performance is based on my percentage of sales, I'm going to screen them out quicker. And you, but you'd so yeah, you can have perverse incentives if you don't watch it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I've come across various other uh, workplace scenarios where one target sort of has an adverse consequence somewhere else. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that, um, and the, that came up in the chat, which would be interesting one to explore that Alan raised, was about the... Um, legitimate interest not applying to public mm. authorities so those yeah. subject to a freedom of information act yeah. um and yet it's still cited in privacy notices so what, what, what's your what's your take on that are well, some organizations right. outside the scope of this yeah i mean it's quite right that public bodies you know in their statutory public task functions cannot rely on legitimate interest because they shouldn't have to because they can rely on legal mm. obligation public task uh etc so it is fascinating if, if a public body wants to deploy this sort of software, how they can justify it, how you can justify the processing. Uh, you know, whether they change contracts of employment, I don't know. Whether they try and argue it's a legal obligation or it's in their public function to be efficient, and this is another way of driving efficiency. Yeah, I think they're gonna, they would find a creative way of finding the condition, I suppose, or a condition. Yeah. In a way, it comes down to the same thing, because if you're still trying to argue it's necessary for our public task to be an efficient public body mm -hmm. to monitor our employees work in this way, how do you actually back that up? Yeah. You'll be able to back it up. That's the bottom line. But you're, you're quite right. It's not the legitimate interests. Uh, just yeah. And I guess also there's, the, there's, there's a challenge, a trade off there, which is probably slightly outside of this, but it, but in terms of quality of transaction compared to quantity of transaction mm. and i think most of us have all got experience of call centers where you ring them up and these days it's almost standard every single one of them saying due to unprecedented demand you're in a queue mm. uh, so whenever when when is the never unprecedented demand so <laughs> separate question um but certain organizations so very often you find it's a very unfulfilling experience you don't get questions answered and yet one organization I work with, my broadband provider, they've got a brilliant help desk where a call center where the staff actually know the job. Mm. They don't work off scripts and they you have a you have a very, very different interaction. Mm. And it's this this whole idea of this monitoring to such a tight level. There's a challenge there that you're actually mixing up that quantity of transaction with the quality and going back to your insurance thing. So, again, the, are these some unintended consequences of employee monitoring? And that's again, it still comes back to you. You're quite right, Alan. Uh, 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 Julian, try and read another comment there. Alan, Julian, <laughs> it comes back to the uh, what are we trying to, what, what business objective are we seeking to fulfill here? Mm. Forget the data side of it, forget anything else. What is actually the outcome? And if it's yeah. customer satisfaction, well, how do you actually start to measure that? You know, how do you define that and how do you quantify customer satisfaction? Mm -hmm. It's maybe the call handling is clearly an element of that, but is duration of call, swiftness of response, purely the only metric that backs up yeah. customer satisfaction? Yeah, yeah. That's, and it's working through. Well, what are what are we what business objectives are we seeking to achieve here, and then going down from that. Mm. 
and the temptation is it's often run the other way it's well this software looks brilliant it'd be great to know that about staff let's turn it on and yeah like, hang on <laughs> why what what's it going to do what's it going to yeah. shoot mm. Yeah, another thing that's worth exploring really is the fact that sort of particularly through the pandemic, with people now working from home significantly more than they have done in the past, the formerly fairly rigid boundary between work and home, mm. employed life and private life was quite, they were very, very clearly separate. Mm. Clearly, if you've got software, if you've got tools that somebody's using to um, monitor somebody's behavior particularly sort of capturing images from the the screen of the computer mm. or sorry images from the camera mm. then that will be picking up the person's home environment so therefore mm. there may well be some issues there around what's being recorded and yeah, yeah there's, so these boundaries about public and private what your, your quality of home life starts to get um, a bit more challenging yeah absolutely it does and and, and what will happen i think you can see the 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 implication being that, well, you're essentially working, your, your home is now your office. Well, okay, staff might start to around and say, well, okay, I need more equipment then. Mm. You want me to be in an environment where I can work and do this and do this. I need not just to be stuck in a corner in this of the kitchen that I've managed to commandeer. Mm. Right, I'm going to need X, Y, and Z. And how, you, know, you want me to show that I'm working and prove all these things. I need more equipment, more device, more support. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or we have a balance and we show we're being mature and we manage people in the right way and get motivated staff who want to do it and engage in the you know appropriate ways that don't mean we need to know every single bit of data about them from the moment they are on to the moment they clock on mm. yeah but also there's the issue then if you've got maybe you've got family photographs on the wall behind you or books or other things that are uh, that where somebody with uh, doing some monitoring could pull information off that, again, that's that that is creating probably quite a, an interesting legal mm. challenge there. And there was a question, there's various questions there about employment contracts mm. and changes there about. So I think Alan started the question about um, legal basis six one B as part of an employment contract yeah, with so the implicit that. balance, and there were various other views came through from Tony and Stephen. Uh, so I'm just interested in your thoughts around the the contractual side. I guess I'll touch upon in the in, in the session. I think I mean it's it's a route, but how whether they would stand up and, and again it comes back to the necessity. So you're saying before you turned on the surveillance stuff, I didn't need to be monitored to do my job. Mm -hmm. a bit of monitor me in the office why don't you turn all those things on in the office when i was sat there well you didn't do it then so now you're saying it's necessary a part of my contract of employment to have them turned on now the only difference is that you can't physically see me in the office so what's mm -hmm. changed and i think it's i think as the comments say you know unfair unfair terms can be struck down actually supporting them and backing up that it's a contractual requirement to be process have this data processed about you I, I'm no contract lawyer, but that's seems like a hard sell. It would be hard sell, and I think also for many people, they could justifiably state that they this is outside the terms of the contract they 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 they're working under. So unless, like you like you said in your presentation about, unless you've gone through and you've renegotiated and set people up with new contracts that allow for monitoring, um, straight away you're potentially opening yourself up to to lawsuits. And it may well be that. The assumption is that all our minions couldn't afford a lawyer to do this, but you might be surprised. It's probably not a very safe course to follow. Well, or the fun thing then will be to say, okay, all staff have got to do it, and suddenly you realise you're saying it's a senior management. Mm. Now, that's always the fun thing with these things, isn't it? When you actually turn around and say, okay, well, that means all of you then, <laughs> in the upper echelons, you're all going to be monitored at home. We're going to see the yeah. data on you just make them think well okay what is, oh well, no well, my role's different clearly that doesn't apply to me because my value to the business is shown in other ways i'm out networking or i'm reading a paper to make notes to annotate it to type it up mm -hmm. i'm not going to sit in front of a screen so you can trick well, hang on is there, <laughs> you, that might be true for you but let's look at the rest of the workforce how can we show that for some roles that equally applies and for other ones it is quite different it'd be useful to track mm -hmm. and monitor certain things I think, I think that's also there's another tension here is in terms of some other legislation so if you're in financial services the problems around insider dealing mm. insider trading is such that 
you may well have to be doing some level of monitoring to be mm. able to demonstrate that you've got the right checks and balances in place yes. to make sure people aren't trading unfairly. So again, that's another pull in another direction away from the employee, but towards the organisation. And that might be then under the conditions, not legitimate interest, but saying, well, actually, it's a legal obligation on us. Mm. Anti-money laundering, anti-bribe. We've got to be able to show that we've done all we can to reduce the risk of that. And these tools do enable it. Yeah. But even still, the necessity, the proportionality, the transparency is still critical. Um, yeah. And you would probably think that people working in financial services might recognise the regulatory legal side mm -hmm. of, of that the company's got to follow through. But again, it's probably down to the employers to make sure they're not doing intrusive monitoring. So I think some of the tools that I've heard about that are trying to monitor where your eyes are on the screen, mm. whether you're actually looking at the screen or you're just sitting in front of it, gazing out of the window. Mm. Um, some of those things you think, mm, that's probably getting a bit into a, an interesting, strange, different area. And actually there's there's a question that Patrick's put in the chat, of, which would be interesting to explore further is, seeing what extent legitimate interest in processing is either fully or partly the interest of the data subject. Well, that's interesting. I mean, it does say it's, it is the third party. So mm. it's about legitimate interest pursued by the data controller. So normally the, the organization is deploying the software or by a third party. But it is equally, as we said, the interests of the right, the, the individual. It's supposed to be a weighing up of both sides. Mm. So the legitimate interests, yeah, is, is considering both the interests of the organization and the individual. You're yeah. supposed to look at it from both sides. Uh, and most lots of organizations often fall down on this because they look at the former bit and not the latter. <laughs> yeah. And I suppose also thinking about maybe the call center scenario, you've got the transaction itself and what's being discussed there, where the data subject of the transaction is the customer mm -hmm. is ringing the call center. Mm -hmm. But also in terms of the monitoring, the data subject is also the employee. So mm. you've got overlapping data subjects there. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, exactly. So in those sort of ones, you're, yeah. And that's why I think the on the call centre ones where the, the, the transparency tells people up front, these calls are recorded for monitoring purposes. Well, mm. there's some transparency. And why the ones with the taking the credit cards, uh, often the, the recording dips out for the PCI D DSS compliance because you don't want to have the credit card details recorded as audio mm. and just sat there in a log that someone can you know, harvest uh, later. Well, it certainly increases the value of that data when most of that conversation wouldn't have the value. So yes, you're absolutely right that thinking of the rights and freedoms of all the data subjects involved is, is, mm. is critical. Yeah. Um, so Alan's asked a couple of questions. So we'll go, go through a couple of Alan's ones there. So the first one of sort of question is the he's asking about the boundary of what's per permissible under legitimate interest worries him. So we can automatically monitor any parameter at scale now that folks operate online. Is that a, is that a valid well, not, concern? Well, not automatically. That's that's kind mm. of what we're trying to say here is that we can automatically do it from a technical point of view. You can turn it on, mm. but that doesn't give you an automatic data protection compliance. And that's that's what this is all about, actually showing Mm -hmm. you know, doing a DPIA to really think of it as a, a as a point of principle. What are we actually trying to do? And then actually once we say, well, look, we do need to do some of this, how we back up our use of legitimate interest to do each of the processing activities. So yeah, we can automatically turn it on, but we don't get automatic compliance. And I think mm. that's yeah. Good. Yeah. Interesting. Another interesting question from Alan. Um and who's obviously got a quite an interest in this subject, is about the same performance management can be based on assumptions and not recognise flexible working patterns. Presence, presence monitoring and measuring away time during working hours could be used with underpinning assumptions about work patterns. And I think you also mentioned earlier about uh, disability and sort of people mm. needing uh, sort of adapted working environments. There's some interesting challenges there. What, any thoughts from you on that? Well, but again, I think this is not, uh, you know, well, no, actually I'm not going to push past the buck on because it's, it's the HR side of things. Mm. If HR can explain how this data helps the organization fulfill its human resource obligations, its management of staff and its management of the workforce, then we can start to discuss well, what's proportionate and how far do we go. Mm. When that bit's completely absent or not been thought through, other than I think as Rowena so wonderfully puts it, it looks nice and shiny and everyone else has got it, so we'll turn it on. 
Mm. Well, that's not a rationale for even deciding, you know, to, for, for starting the collection and processing of the data. But it very often happens that way, sadly. Mm. It's seen as a whiz bang thing. It looks shiny. It looks new and modern. If you say to someone and say to a manager, would you like to know more data about your employees? Probably the answer will be yes, because it's just, oh, well, why wouldn't I? Well, that shouldn't be the question. It's how, how can we better manage the workforce and help you manage them to achieve our objectives? Mm. Might have nothing to do with data. <laughs> you know, yes. And, and, that, and that's what's the bit that's often overlooked. And that's, that's the uh, first step, critical first step. Yeah. And so there's another question point being raised, which has been an interesting one. So if somebody's asking, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on rights requests in this area, mm. particularly access requests and how complying with those might be impacted by staff monitoring. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, and that's where, again, thinking through maybe not the legitimate interest bit of it, but the bit above that, the DPIA, the Data Protection Impact Assessment, because, yes, this is all data about staff. It could all be requested under subject access. It could all be asked to be deleted by the employee to check and see whether you still need it. And if you haven't thought through that those requests could come in, we all know the resource impact of trying to deal with a subject access request. If we've got every email that's ever been kept mm -hmm. on that employee, well, this just multiplies and amplifies that you know, tenfold. If you've got 10 times the amount of data, because you've not just got every uh, email they've ever transacted on, you've got no, you've got all the data about their usage every day, mm -hmm. every action they've ever taken since you turned it on. So I think the the uh, impact is about resource. If you don't think about it up front before you turn it on, you're just making a really even bigger headache trying to deal with subject access requests and erasure requests. And those requests will come in mm -hmm. <laughs> because if someone's like, so if an employee believes, oh, hang on, I've been discriminated against here or this data has been used against me. I can't believe my data is any worse than Bob's over there. I want to see my data. Mm. They're going to make the request and actually yeah. give it more information to go to a tribunal or argue their case mm. about. So, so yeah, it's the age old problem. We need to think around how much data we're collecting and storing on employees because they can ask to see all of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and actually, in that, there's a, a, a sort of a scenario raised by Stephen, which is about the risk of lawsuits there. So um, he's raised a point about they've got one group where managers use the remote support tools installed on their staff laptops to turn on the inbuilt capture camera and capture video. One employee was disturbed by his four-year-old son coming into the room having removed his clothes. Mm. The captured video means his manager is currently facing the possibility of trial for production of child pornography. Mm. And you think that's, again, this blurring of the work environment and the private environment, there's, that's a quite an interesting, challenging situation there. It certainly is, yeah. Because my first thoughts are, well, as the classic data protection experts' responses, it's going to depend, isn't it? Because if the employee was told this is the monitoring we're going to do and why we're doing it, when you're at work, we'd rather have the you know your doors shut and, and that you're going to, you know, mm -hmm try and keep the space free of relatives and, and children while working between these hours. Uh, if anything happens where anything untoward happens, we will immediately review and erase that uh, recording, mm -hmm. flag it up to us. You know, you could have all these measures in place, potentially, to try and mitigate the risk of such a thing happening, as in content being created without someone mm -hmm. knowing, without, and, but if none of that's in place, then you get into these sort of issues that, crikey, hang on, we've got this on file, this has been captured, nobody kind of knew about it. Mm. It's captured for an hour, you know, an hour's worth of content, and we didn't think through the implications here. Yeah, so I think, I mean, that scenario is a really good one where the risks of somebody doing something without being fully open about it, just because yeah. you can turn the camera on, doesn't necessarily mean you should. Uh, oh, Stephen's added a comment there, it was covert, the video came to light when the server drive filled up. So, uh, yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, Tony's also had a question there about um, tools helping identify staff who might have additional needs, so it's better to be supportive and get information and than be presumptive about reasons people are not as active in vertical commas mm. as others. Yeah. So again, it, and it's a, it, yeah, it's about you know, and that in theory is good HR management before any of these tools came along, isn't it? Uh, yeah. and, and actually, 
we may uh, we may get the data from these tools that can articulate and highlight some of the issues that uh, people with uh, additional needs may have. But we should have surely addressed that before the data flagged it up. Oh, definitely. <laughs> but 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 <laughs> we may haven't. Maybe haven't, and that's the that's the broader issue. And I guess some of this is down to sort of to be a good manager, there's a lot of subtlety needed. You've got to have a lot of vibes. You've got to be able to do many things. And assuming that mm -hmm. a piece of software can overcome lots of organizational deficiencies, mm -hmm. um, it's a bit of a, a dangerous trap to get into, I guess, because there's um, a lot of managers out there. We've probably all had experience of them. Maybe I'm not the best managers. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they were then reliant on software to try and overcome their deficiencies, you think, mm, that's maybe not going to work so well. No, no, exactly. And it'll just get worse because actually, <laughs> You know, if you purely rely on the data and the numbers, you're probably not going to be able to manage the staff as a whole in the best way possible. Because mm. it's it, it, so this is you know this sort of software and things is is probably part of a solution. It's not this isn't trying to you know damn it all down and say none of it's useful, but being the complete sort of you know three year old in a room, it's like well why? What's it going to do? How's it going to achieve it? What's it going to help us do? Yeah, and then you can find the right lawful basis and you can find the right rationale. Mm. It, it's the it's the problem we all know that often occurs is that these things are just turned on because they're there and it's easy to turn them on. And then suddenly we have to deal with all the ramifications because we're <laughs> catching up with ourselves and we're just generating data as we go. And it's, that's what we're trying to, uh, yeah, trying to, trying to counter against by running this mm. session, I think. <laughs> and I guess one thing I'm, I'm just thinking through as we're talking through is, is the, I just wonder if the effectiveness of these monitoring tools is actually going to be going down significantly. Because if the if the jobs market is such where there are uh, fewer jobs available than people searching for the jobs, so you, you're actually if you've got one, you want to hang on to it, then that level of intrusive monitoring is something you probably would put up with on on the basis that well, at least I've got a job, so I'll put up with this monitoring. Now we're in a situation where the jobs market is very different. Mm -hmm. Um, then you're actually running a risk that those people who are better, more clued up, they're a bit more savvy, are the ones who are probably going to jump ship anyway, and you're going to be left with the ones who maybe the also runs. And so there may well be a real issue that the effectiveness of any, any monitoring like this is actually significantly worse now and may actually have some quite significant detrimental effects. And you can pretty much follow through some of the logic to think, well, because if, if it was a condition that someone said, well, okay, you can... We're going to monitor if you work remotely or if you come or you can come into the office and work because we don't turn it on in the office because why would we because we're all in the office mm -hmm. so, well okay well i'll come to the office then <laughs> but that's going to then cost me and i want more cost to travel and then the, and then the ones working at home are going well, hang on well <laughs> if they're all going into the office because they're not going to be monitored what are they doing how do you prove that they're as effective as i am if my data streams turn on and there's just, oh, it just the hr ramifications and the disputes mm -hmm. that can come from this you know without being an hr expert it doesn't take much for someone to really don't take much of that to think that's going to be a real pain that is a real headache yeah and i think again it goes back to the point about um, poor management poor leadership of mm. these tools applied inappropriately and, and incorrectly are actually going to have a massive impact on the organization the negative one <laughs> um so another question's come through from christine so just she's just wanting to draw on other legitimate interest assessment experiences and challenges and just getting any, any thoughts about parallels from other contexts yeah, really well, I've got, i mean one that comes up a lot with the work i've done over the years is um for marketing so obviously electronic direct marketing is all about consent but when it comes to you know postal marketing you can rely on legitimate interest when it comes to saying well we want to share data with facebook to do use their tools customer audiences look like audiences well nobody agrees to that sharing they might have signed up for an email update from you nobody agreed to for their data to be passed to facebook so facebook can send them adverts via facebook or mm. facebook can do look at their profile look at similar ones to send them adverts and that's all been done under legitimate interest by organizations uh you know some of them who aren't informed are just doing it without any assessment and just doing it because they think it's good and so they're really you know not really able to back up what they're doing the ones that know what they're doing are at least looking at this area engaging some expertise and thinking well okay can we we're going to pass this data to facebook without people's agreement can we really back that up show our interests so why we're doing it why it's necessary and then it's not going to override people's rights and freedoms by passing their data to the 
all-seeing eye that is you know facebook or google analytics or what have you so that's where we see a lot of legitimate interest assessments being done in the sort of marketing mm. social media side of things uh, and it can be fascinating some some and it's a, not, not quite a 50 50 split but certainly it makes organizations just think a bit that oh hang on i can't just pass this to another organization without weighing up the potential impact and just mm-hmm. delving a bit into you know facebook's assurances or the strength of facebook's assurances that they don't use the data for their own ends mm. they say they don't or they certainly increasingly say they don't but just making the organization have to think about that and test that out a bit yeah. record it is a good thing and an accountable thing for them to do so another thought that's just springing to mind that's an interesting challenge in this area is the i mean assuming that all this data is getting scored in the cloud somewhere in verticom mm. somewhere um Presumably, there's quite a few issues and risks around the fact that it may be transferred to other national jurisdictions, whether that's America, whether it's China, mm-hmm. and the implications there. Again, that potentially opens up another massive mm-hmm. minefield if somebody's not gone into it fairly carefully. Yeah, especially if we look at the broader rights and freedoms that people may wish to, you know, being in the UK and in the EU, they feel, you know, whether they realise it or not, got quite strong rights and do things. Mm. If by your processing of their data under the dismal interest, you passing it elsewhere you know, have you thought through the implications of that uh, and the other one just to just to, well, coming towards the end but mm. it's the fact to always to remember people can object to processing mm. based on legitimate interests so and, and that's always quite a fun challenge to push back to organizations when they say what well, we're going to rely on legitimate interests you say okay are you going to tell people because they might want to object and go, yeah. well, oh, hang on <laughs> Well, if it's so fair and necessary and you weigh things up and you believe in it, surely you can be transparent and give people the ability to say no if they don't like it or mm. challenge it based on their circumstances. And that really is sort of the acid test when you say that. Are you going to be open about it and let people raise a concern? Well, if you believe in it and you've done the right assessment and can back it up, you should be ready to, to be open and, and take those objections if mm. people have them. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Right. So we're just about running out of time. So I've got a, I've got a final sort of closing question here, which I think would be interesting one to just test things out a little bit, because yeah. no, normally when um, you and Rowena are doing this, you play the part of the trade union shop steward yes. acting on behalf of the employees. And yeah. Rowena plays the part of the overbearing manager who's got this bright idea. I can do all this monitoring. is wonderful. Yeah. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just thinking in terms of, have you got any quest, any thoughts or any suggestions for if, if somebody is an employee in an organisation where there is monitoring being in, introduced, they maybe don't have a shop steward they can go to, mm. but they've actually got some concerns about that. Have you got any thoughts about strategies where people could raise that in a way where, like you're saying there, re- objecting to it being a legitimate treatment of their data? Any thoughts on those strategies for how that people oh, yeah. in a workplace situation? I mean, the, the the gentle ones are just to, you know, ask for the information and say, okay, well, I assume you've done a legitimate interest assessment. Can I see a copy of it? Mm-hmm. I assume you've done a DPIA for this. Can I see a copy of it? Can I, you know, can I see some of this uh, detail that I'm sure you've got, you know, because clearly mm-hmm. you've done it because you're an accountable, trusted organisation and employer of mine. So ask to see that first of all, because if they haven't got any of that, then you know there's you know not really been much thought being put into it, and you can then raise the lack of thought as an issue. Mm. If they have done that, then that's good. You should be able to start to see how well they've gone through some of the impl- considerations and be able to use that and question that and ask the right questions. Say, so, well, look, you said this here. I, I don't believe that because mm. you don't realize the implications of X, or when did you consult Y? So that's the sort of gentlish short sure, approach. I mean, the 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 uh the stronger one is to put, uh, start putting subject access requests in and just ask to see your own data. Mm. I mean, that might not make you no friends at all within your, your colleagues, mm. but it will highlight the point. Yeah. It is your data. They are storing it. You'd like to see a copy of it, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah, it would get so you Alan fired. just wanted to love your answer, yeah. but it gets you fired anyway as a nuisance. Yeah, and I think that's the problem. But, but, but I think also, I think that the point I made earlier about the jobs market is... <laughs> If you have an employer who is starting to behave that way, then we all have the right to up sticks and try and find some other employment. And at the moment, with the, the market being it, the way it is, 
any most people in professional environments so actually what i'm hearing is they're, they're moving in fairly easily and there's a fact shortages in many areas mm -hmm. so um yeah it could be it could be a case where this actually the, the asking the question of your employer if you've got concerns about how they're treating you may actually be the one that confirms whether they're the right employer mm -hmm. to be working for yeah indeed Good. Okay, so it's been a really interesting topic, uh, a really interesting discussion. I had a few comments, people thanking the answers and what have you on that one. Um, so on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank Gary for stepping in to fill the breach to be acting as both Gary and Rowena tonight. Uh, normally it would have been Gary doing one side and Rowena the other. Um, and just for reference, the, uh, this event has been recorded. It will be appearing on the BCS member groups YouTube channel in a, about a week or so once the processing has been done. So if you want to share that with other people later, then by all means do so. And finally, just a quick plug for the virtual conference we've got coming up on the between the 20th and 24th of June all on the subject around open data. So uh, we've got some really excellent speakers lined up. So I hope to see you at one of those. Um, if not, we'll see you at a future event. Uh, but once again, just like to thank Gary for his time tonight. Much appreciated. A really interesting conversation. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.